I'm Nancy Thomas. I'm so excited to be here with you. Thank you for spending this time with me. I've got such exciting stuff I want to share with you because I've been there where I'm hitting the roadblock with a child I'm trying to help not going anywhere and we feel like we're spinning and spinning and spinning and we're both going down. So I've got solutions for you. Let's get started. We're going to talk about roadblocks. And let's go into looking into that a little bit more. What happens? It keeps them from moving forward in their healing process. The lying continues. The stealing continues. The inappropriate behaviors that we're trying to stop just keep going. When we're using the right parenting techniques, we've got a great therapist on board, and the healing's not happening, it's because we've hit one of these roadblocks. It keeps them trapped in the past. They stay there. They're stuck in what happened to me. I've been traumatized. I've been traumatized. I've been traumatized. Rather than, you know what? I have a loving home. I have good food and a family that cares about me. They can't even see it. They just see the roadblock. The roadblock. They act out their feelings instead of talking them out. They don't trust you to come to you and say, you know what? I'm scared or I'm really sad about this or I'm really afraid. Whatever is going on, they're not trusting you to come to you because... Roadblock keeps them from being able to do that. It makes them push love away with their behaviors. A lot of our little ones found that love hurts because they got their hearts so broken by trying to love someone that they don't want more love. And the more you love them, the more they fight you. We've got to get through the past and heal that trauma that's going in there that's making that roadblock. They can heal once we get past the blockage. When we hit a roadblock, when we're driving down the road in our car, there's a nice sign that says, you know, there's construction here, caution, detour. So turn this way, and we're like, okay, we turn this way. Now turn that way, now turn this way, and we go around the roadblock, and we're back on the path. That's what this webinar is gonna do for you. Help you to know which way we go to get around whichever roadblock you're facing. Or maybe you're just gonna get the whole road construction crew moving faster so the healing can happen because you're going to heal what's in the way of the progress because you want your child to be loving and caring and kind successful as an adult and that's what I want for you too I want the chaos to stop some of the roadblocks that I have seen that we've had to get around or through were secrets when they hold secrets they can't move forward it's poison we're going to cover it in depth Unresolved trauma. It's not taken care of. It doesn't just heal. It has to be opened up and taken care of so that they can move forward. Triangulation, whoo, it's a bad one. It's a block. When they don't feel safe, there will be no healing happening. Pain and hunger, big issues for some of our children. And structure and nurture balance, they have to have a healthy balance going on here or they crash. We'll talk about how to help that balance to be stable for you. We're going to start with secrets because it's a big one. It's like poison to their spirit, poison to the healing. It just stops everything in its tracks, all right? So there's five areas that a child can hold secrets. Lies they've told that they haven't ever told the truth about, things they've broken, things they've stolen, animals or babies that they've hurt, sex things that they've done. And the sex things hurts them on a lot of different levels. So that's usually the worst of it, okay? And that could even just be accessing pornography, just huh, toxic poison they can't get out of their brains. And with the electronics we have today, they can really get into a lot of trouble there. We had one little guy, front row, in school, is the only place he had internet access, and when they looked at the history of the computer he was using there in front of the teacher, 10,000 times he had accessed pornography. So it can be something they did with a neighbor kid or something from their past that someone did to them when they were very vulnerable. It blocks. Until they talk about it, it just blocks the healing. So all of these areas can have secrets. And you know what? Every kid has a secret. <laughs> oh, your guess is pretty good. They have a secret they need to clean out. All right, especially if you're hitting a roadblock and they're not, the healing's not moving forward. So I list the five areas, and then I have them repeat back to me what the five areas are. And they will leave out the one or two areas that they have the biggest secrets in. 
So it just gives us a little Freudian view of where we're going to have the biggest issues that they've got to clean out. Okay? We don't let them know that. We just make note of it. And they'll start with the easy ones and then they'll get to the bigger ones. Secrets. Scar. Truth transforms when they decide to break that down and tell you the truth, they're free. They can move forward, they can soar to the heights of success. They have to get there by trusting you. So let me help you with how we get there. It's a vicious cycle when they have a secret. The event occurs, whether it was the lie or the sexual behavior or whatever, and then they block the secret in. They don't want to tell, they don't want to get in trouble, they don't want to face it. Shame and guilt build up and distort their body. We see this kind of body language where they bring their shoulders forward, protecting their heart, okay, rather than here, open. Or they get more here defensive, kind of leaning back and stiff, rather than just confident and okay. It distorts their body, it distorts their spirit, it distorts their behavior. Their strength is drained because they have to put a lot of energy into keeping that from being revealed, not letting it, something slip or leaving any clues out. And then because they're weak from holding the secret, the event occurs again and again and again and again. And they get stuck in the cycle that builds up more and more shame and makes them weaker and weaker. One little guy at one of our camps was climbing the rock wall and he would get part way up and he'd start to, you know, I can't do it, I can't do it. And his dad would cheer him and we'd all cheer him, come on, you can do it, you can do it. Trying to share our enthusiasm to help him to boost himself up and he'd slide all the way down. And he'd rest a little while and he'd try again and again and again. With everyone cheering him, he couldn't do it. That night, his brother finally trusted his parents enough to share what he'd been doing to his little brother. As the older brother revealed his secrets, got the strength together, he helped his little brother as well. So we pulled the little brother in and said, you know what, your big brother just told everything he's been doing, so now you can tell. <clears throat> he cleaned out all his secrets, and the next morning he climbed to the top of the rock wall and he rang that bell. And I can still feel that moment, because he was free. Holding those secrets back make them weak. You're, they're struggling, they're drowning, and you're doing every single thing you can to help them. And it's a roadblock. Let's help them get past it. They have to feel safe with strong, loving leadership. Very, very important that we're powerful leaders in a loving way. Not military drill sergeants snapping orders, giving commands, but in a loving way, guiding our children. We have to pass the five tests for them to trust us. Can I interrupt you? Absolutely not. Can I get you to repeat yourself or stand there and watch me repeat myself over and over because I'm not speaking clearly? When they can control you, they cannot trust you. Can I get you to believe my lies? You believe them? They think they're smarter than you are. You're their protector. If they are smarter than you are, they don't feel safe. You have to be the superhero. You have to pass the test that they give you so they know you would protect them if the same events were to occur again that happened to them in the early childhood. Can I possess your possessions? Are they stealing from you and getting away with it? They can't trust you because somebody could steal them from you because you're not on duty sharp enough, all right? Can I hurt your animals or your young children? This one's really huge. This is my puppy, Alon. Yeah, that's you. And I gotta tell you, I'm terrible. I talk baby talk to her. I spoil her rotten. I can't spoil the children, but I can spoil the pooch. And the children see us loving our dogs and talking baby talk and giving them cookies and buying them toys and whatever stuff that we do. They see the love that we have for them. But they block seeing the love that we have for the, the child. So they say, well, you love that dog. You love that dog. Would you protect that dog? If I tried to hurt that dog, would you stop me from hurting him? If I tried to kick that dog, the dog can't talk. If I tried to choke the dog, the dog can't tell on me. Bruises don't show. Would you protect 
the puppy or the kitten, whatever your favorite snuggle bug is. If they can hurt your animals, they won't trust you to protect them. And the animals don't appreciate it either. Huh, Elon? <laughs> they see how much we love our animals because we're very clear about it and they're standing back looking at us. They don't see how much we love them. They really often think we love their siblings more than we love them. Not understanding how much time and energy it takes to help a challenging child. They get more of our time, more of our prayers, more of our financial help, more of our driving around, more of our phone calls to the school. <laughs> <laughs> they don't get it all right because they can see the love we have for the pets when they can hurt them it makes that real clear to them that we will not protect the child either all right so you gotta be super careful on those things if you've messed it up and let a child interrupt you or you're repeating yourself or any of those things is it too late absolutely not <sighs> Take a big deep breath, get strong, start over. It's not too late. As long as the child's breathing, there's hope. We've all messed up, and sometimes I forget, and I repeat myself when they say, oh, I fall for it. But when we really get strong and really get focused, they can begin to trust us, and the healing happens. Because the secrets have to come out with someone they trust. We want to give directions, not requests. Would you please brush your teeth is a request for the child who has a trauma affected brain from all the abuse, neglect, whatever medical trauma that they've endured. It enters a different part of their brain and the answer you will get is no. <laughs> okay? So we give a direction. I want you to hop in there and brush your teeth. All right? So we give directions, not requests. We want to expect respect. It's huge for them to trust you. They have to respect you. Yes, Mom. Yes, Dad. May I please be excused from the table? May I please get a drink of water? It's very different from, uh-huh, uh -huh, I'm thirsty. Not that your children would speak to you like that. <laughs> well, mine used to when they first came, and they didn't respect or honor anyone, including themselves. For them to have self-respect, they've got to respect you. All right, so we have respect in our homes, and that helps them to build that trust so they can get there to clean the secrets out. All right, the way they talk, they make eye contact when they're speaking to me, or you know what? I can't hear without seeing their eyes. I learned that from my husband. He read lips for a lot of years before he got his hearing aids. And when they weren't looking at him, or when I wasn't looking at him, he couldn't hear me because he couldn't read my lips. And I was like, oh, okay, I can use that with the children as well. All right? Our body language needs to be respectful to them. We're not talking to them with our hands on our hips like this. And they're not speaking to us with their hands on our hips, on their hips. All right? Body language, the eye rolling, the different things that communicate, I don't respect you, have to stop. Zero arguing. That's huge. I don't argue with a child. One thing that Sprouts Mom says often that I love is, I love you too much to argue with you. Some parents like to set up, you know, we're going to do arguing on Wednesday afternoons at 4. I've set up a time for that. Today it's not on the schedule. All right? A couple of love and logic tips there. And we do love the love and logic program. As soon as our children get healthy enough, we move on to using that. But until their brain heals, we've found they just don't do real well with the choices or any of the other parenting options out there that are behavior modification. Uh, how do we get them to reveal? Share with them that they can get out of trouble, not into trouble by being strong and telling on themselves. They're afraid they're going to be punished or you're going to be angry with them. So we need to let them know we're not going to be angry. We have to mean that. I get happy when my children get strong enough to come to me and share secrets, things that they've done. I get proud of them, that they have the courage to say, you know what, I messed up, and I want to move forward. No matter what they've done, short of killing grandma, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't get angry. I tell them about the poison it creates in their life that wrecks the fun, that we want them to be happy, and the poison is interfering with that happiness. So, 
The way I do that is I put my hand on the child's heart and I just listen and I feel it for a moment. I don't do that with a 16-year-old teenager, okay? But with the younger ones, I will, okay? When they're, they have some privacy so no one else is listening and they're calm, not in the middle of a tirade, all right? I tell them I know their secrets in their heart and that secrets are poison. There's actually a song that secrets are poison. Anyway, um, that I want them to get strong. I want them to get strong enough to clean it out by telling me because once they tell the secret, it's no longer a secret. It has no power to hurt them. Not getting in trouble. There's no punishment. There's no consequence. I will not be angry. It's a get out of jail free card pretty much. Okay. So then I ask them what happens when they have a splinter or a sliver under their skin. And they'll often say, well, it gets red and sore and that green stuff builds up. Yeah, that yucky pus builds all up. Sure. And if we keep cleaning that off and leaving the sliver in there, it'll still stay sore with the infection building up. Just like a secret does. They get a secret and it's like a sliver in their heart. And the infection and the soreness is the inappropriate behaviors that gets them in trouble all the time. And we want them to get out of trouble and be able to be happy and not mess up, go into the swimming pool or whatever fun events we've got over and over and over. You know how they sabotage all the fun? It's because they got a roadblock and they don't feel like they deserve the fun. They're so afraid they've got to stay focused on keeping that secret in so it doesn't spill out. And they get the courage together to grab it and let it go. It takes a lot of power. It takes a lot of courage. We don't use anger in this process. When they feel safe, we ask. We listen. That means we're silent. Okay, when we're listening, we're silent. And then we validate. Not interrogate. <clears throat> validate. Good job spitting that one out, sweetheart. I'm so proud of you. Well done getting the courage to say that. I'm so glad that secret can't hurt you any longer. Right? Ask. Listen. Validate. When they tell, they like to start with a tiny little secret, like I stole a pack of gum. Okay? Just to see how you're going to react. Okay? They want to, like, test the waters. When you stay calm and loving and don't get all defensive, well, where was I? Well, what was I doing? Well, who was watching you then? Okay? When we get defensive like that, it shuts down. The door was open. The secrets were starting to come out. You just shut it. When they start to open it and we encourage and support and love, it can get wider and wider open until all of it can come out and they're free. And that's what we want. We want them to be absolutely free from all their stuff. Correct responses. Good job telling the truth about that. And another big hug. I'm so glad you got that yucky secret off your heart. Now that secret can't hurt you anymore. Look how strong you are to tell that big secret. Well done. And every time they have the courage to open their heart, we open ours by opening our arms and pulling them to our heart. Just changes their brain while they're changing their heart. Always give a hug after every surge of strength that carries a secret out. That acceptance is vital. They're so afraid you're going to reject them when you find out the stuff they've done. That's total acceptance, pulling them to your heart. Total acceptance. But let's fine tune the hugs a little bit, okay? Spend a little bit of time on Hugs 101. First thing we do is open our heart. Proud of our child. They had courage. They showed strength. They showed they want to heal. Then we open our arms. The leader's arms are on the top when we hug someone. Okay? The child's arms are below the adults unless they're four years old and younger. The child's ear is on the adult, so they're hearing our heartbeat. Their heart is hearing our heart, so they can go into sync with the rhythm of each other's hearts. The adult heart will lead the child's heart to the right rhythm. We don't want the child's chin on us. When they dig their chin in, it's to push us away, and it's a defensive move. Their ear on us is acceptance. The chin on you is rejection. So a lot of times we have to teach and guide, okay? Flat hands on the back. No padding. This interferes with the full 
force of a hug. You know, they have measured an electrical exchange of current between the two bodies. When we hug, it's like recharging a battery. But this is an intermittent exchange of energy and power. And if they need to burp, then please pat them. But if they don't need to burp, then flat hands on the back. Firm, strong, powerful arms of leadership and protection. Embrace the child in a warm, firm hug and then release. Then the child releases. The child doesn't release first. So you don't push it until they're like pushing you away. All right? A healthy, appropriate amount of time. You know your child. Then you smile in each other's eyes to seal it forever. Just as you back up from the hug, smile in their eyes. Just a quick, brief glance. You don't have to hold them and stare at each other. <laughs> That's powerful. They see your eyes filled with acceptance. They're going to be digging for more secrets to clean them out. That's what we want. Prepare your heart before you ask. Because they might say some really yucky stuff that you didn't know that you could get upset about if you're not prepared. Don't deal with what the issue is. Deal with what they're doing now. All right? No matter what they've done, they are now telling the truth about it. Revealing their secrets is showing you that they want to heal. They do not want to repeat the behavior. They won't reveal what they do want to continue to repeat. <laughs> Why would they lay a trail for themselves? All right? Get happy and proud of them for cleaning out, not angry for the past. Fill your heart with the courage and strength you see in your child. That's a good thing. Secrets. What if they lie? Sometimes our kids are like, you know what, that hug was so awesome, and my mom and dad were so proud of me, I'm going to make up a bunch of baloney. <laughs> uh, I stole all of the gold out of Fort Knox. Right, okay. So, unfortunately, <laughs> sometimes they come up with some pretty big whoppers. So how do we know when they're telling the truth? Because that one, obviously, they didn't. Um, but sometimes it's possible. Well, maybe that really did happen, and I just don't know, and I'm not sure. It's real easy to tell, okay, to know what the truth is. You just watch their behavior after they tell the secret. When they tell the truth, their behavior improves in the next hours, days, weeks. When they lie, their behavior gets worse right away. So you'll know pretty quickly. You see the behavior going, before they go, get in there and say, I'm ready for you to tell me the truth about the last secret you share. It's not good when they're lying about lying, okay? <laughs> Clean the secrets out makes them really strong and really free when it's the truth. I've got a whole webinar on lying if you really get stuck on that one. All right, so keys to getting them to open up. Do not ask yes and no questions. Do you have a secret to tell? They'll say no. <laughs> Shut the door real quick. Don't ask yes and no questions. Are you ready to tell your secrets? No. They just shut the door. All right, open. I like to ask open-ended questions. Do you want to start with a little secret or a big one? Well, they'll want to start with the little secrets, okay? Okay, I'm ready. Go for it. So the door's open rather than I've got it closed. Keep the ball rolling once they start telling the secrets. Good job telling the truth on that. And what else happened? And what else? <laughs> and what else? <laughs> okay. Uh, use lots of smiles and hugs of joy as they clean out and move forward. You're getting through that roadblock. Next one. Unresolved trauma. So many of our little ones have so much pain from their past. Rejection by birth mom is called the primal wound because it is the deepest wound. And until that is resolved, they can't move forward. Okay? Beatings from their past, rape, neglect, starvation, left to cry with no responder before they were a year old, being separated from birth mom before they're three years of age, whether it's from divorce, uh, hospitalization by mom or the little one, premature birth where the baby's weeks or months in the hospital away from mom, adoption where they're completely separated from birth mom, <clears throat> um, attempted abortion even before they're born, that can cause scars that can be a roadblock for a little one. Some of the other traumas that we found that aren't related to birth families are natural disasters. Floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes can really scare a child to the core and us as well.
but it's trauma for them and it echoes over and over and over in their little heart until we resolve it. Fire, a fire especially in their home but anywhere nearby where they see the destruction of it can be absolutely overwhelming to a little one. Witnessing a murder or a severe beating or any beating, okay? Domestic violence where adults are at full volume and angry, very, very scary for a child. So when we have those traumas from the past, hopefully they're not continuing, okay? Because if it's going on in your house, the child's not going to heal. You are the roadblock. If you're screaming and fighting with your spouse, you're the roadblock, okay? My cowboy and I certainly have disagreements, but screaming and fighting, no. I honor him, I respect him, and he respects me. And sometimes he does stupid stuff. And sometimes I do stupid stuff. And we forgive each other and we move forward. Because he's not stupid and neither am I. But stuff happens. So, if you guys are the roadblocks, you need to get some marriage therapy there. Alright, but anyway. Um, so the solution to past traumas is a great therapist. What does that look like? They're trained to release and resolve trauma. That's huge. They're trained. They're experienced. They know what they're doing. All right? They work with the parent supporting the child. You're not out in the waiting room while they're in there doing a repair job on your child. Your heart and your child's heart are being put together in the office of a mental health professional. Okay? You're a vital part of that. You're not out in the hall. Okay? Um, they use EMDR, which is a kind of therapy, very powerful. These are for war veterans, and our children have the same effects as a war veteran. Okay, scary nightmare memories locked in their little hearts when they were extremely vulnerable. They didn't have an AK-47 or whatever, and a helmet and a flak jacket like our soldiers do, and our soldiers still come back scarred from battle. They were very vulnerable little children without the protections that they needed to have. A flat jacket wouldn't have done it because it was their heart that got hurt. All right? So, therapist needs to have power tools. We're not talking play therapy here. We're not talking talk therapy here. We're talking power tools because these children are deeply wounded. All right? And they need to be tools that are proven to help with trauma. No play therapy, no talk therapy for a child who has trauma or reactive attachment disorder. Um, therapist has to be experienced and have been successful with others. Not, well, I don't really know anything about trauma-affected children or reactive attachment disorder, but I'm willing to learn. Huh? Would you let a heart surgeon? You know, I don't know anything about heart surgery, but I'm willing to learn. Lay down. Let me cut you open and see how it works. <laughs> Absolutely not. Not when our child's drowning. We want somebody who knows what they're doing. Where do we find these people? Well, we have some really great ones on my website. And if you know a really great one, please go on my website. There's a little questionnaire for you to fill out so that we can get them listed so parents can find help. All of the therapists on my website were recommended by other parents who have been to these people and saw results. So each star they have after their name is a different client that has recommended that therapist. The more stars, the more clients have said they were great. I don't know all these therapists. I haven't been in their office. I don't know what kind of um, expertise they have. So I am not personally recommending them. There are certainly some I have worked with and I know they've got some super skills but there are many that I don't know and I want you to have one that's close enough who has the experience to be able to help your child. So attachment.org is my website. There's a little button that says therapist so you can click on there and find a therapist right in your area. We need more. Any of you mental health professionals who want more training, we can help you with that. All right. So, besides a great therapist, they absolutely have to have a healing environment at home. When we use the parenting techniques that we were raised with in a loving home, it'll work. You know, you've tried them. You've explained to the child what's right and what's wrong. You've reminded them what's right and what's wrong. Some parents use grounding or spanking or taking the privilege away or whatever. And the child keeps doing the same behavior over and over and over. 
we have to have a different toolbox to do the advanced parenting that these children need to have. We'll talk about that more later. I'll tell you how you can get the help on that if you don't know. All right, so another roadblock we're going to cover is triangulation. Let's look, take a look at that. They love to play this game, and as long as they keep anybody involved in this triangle game, they will stay sick, okay? So, they pick a part to play. Maybe they're going to be the victim. Poor, poor me. I don't have everything that I want. My parents didn't buy me ten iPads for Christmas. Whatever. They do, poor, poor me, and they get someone to feel sorry for them. Oh, poor, poor sweetums. And somebody's got to be the bad guy, so of course that's usually mom that is selected to play that role. She isn't the bad guy, but the child presents her as that. And they cannot heal when they are playing this game with anyone. Sometimes they do it between mom and dad. There's a plan right in the house. So they're doing, Daddy, Mom was yelling at me today. Mom didn't raise her voice once, but Dad wasn't there. He doesn't know. But maybe he has seen Mom raise her voice in the past, so he's certainly going to believe. Poor, poor sweetums. And Mom must be too tough. Or maybe she's not tough enough. If she would just set some limits, whatever nonsense the child gets parents to believe, we have a wedge driven in the team rather than we're working together as a whole. So, sometimes they're the perpetrator rather than the victim. They pick that role to play. They're going to be the bad guy who's beating up the little brother and you've got to be the rescuer stepping in to save the little brother you feel like you need a referee shirt all day long trying to split up the siblings as they shred each other we're playing the triangle game who are some of the people that these children can suck into their triangulation game grandparents unfortunately have been excellent at stepping into this game and as long as anyone is playing this game the child will not heal. It's that big of a deal. Grandma thinks she's just cuddling and nurturing this poor child who's not getting their needs met. And what she's doing is pushing the child's head under the water when the child's already out there drowning. Because they don't understand. All right, Teachers can also fall for the triangulation game. I've had my children do it. All right, They get out there. I've had over a hundred children in foster care very violent, very out of control, because those are the children that I specialize in. They're my favorites, all right? Get to school, and I haven't communicated with the teacher about this child's special needs. They will fall for those big puppy dog eyes. Oh, my mother doesn't feed me. Right. <laughs> we have tons of food, and I love to cook, and we spend a lot of time around the table visiting, but they'll go to school, and the teacher doesn't know. Neighbors and church family. They are masters of that. We used to not know you have to sit in the back row with the sick kids. And we used to sit up a little farther in the church. And we had this one one little girl. She kept turning around and said, face front, face front, face front, you know, the whole time. Well, pretty quickly, one of the elderly ladies who would sit a row or two behind us started bringing her a gift every Sunday morning. She needed a new stuffed animal every Sunday to cure her little broken heart. Oh, my goodness, as if she didn't have enough here. What she would do is turn around and just to the lady, and then I would correct her. So the lady said, oh, mom's too over-controlling or whatever. Oh, my goodness. And that child started going down the drain. People don't understand our children, and we need to set them up for success by keeping them away from those who don't understand. Sometimes it's siblings setting them up. Mom, he gave me a look. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and then we've got the siblings creating the triangle game right in the house. Sometimes it's spouses. We already talked about mom and dad. Dad thinks mom's too tough. Or, you know, the child's really not that bad. You need to lighten up. He's fine for me. Right, because mom is the target. When there's attachment issues, mom is the target. The child acts very, very different for moms than they do for dads. So dad's dealing with the child he sees. Mom's dealing with the child she sees, opposite ends of the spectrum, all right? Can't let them do that. we got to team up. We have another webinar on that if you're not teamed up. Okay, birth parents that have visits and phone calls can sure set up some triangulation. 
divorced parents trying to hurt each other instead of doing all they can for the children can really cause some huge issues with triangulation. If you're not on the same page, you're hurting your kids. They are not pawns between two angry parents, they're children, and they're very malleable and they cannot be used to hurt each other. So, sort it out. Um, Mirage Mom, where they have this vision of their birth mother. She's like Mother Teresa and Princess Diana combined into perfection. And she's out there with her arms open waiting for them to come to her so she can give them everything that they want and never set any limits and boundaries because only mean mothers say no you can't do that right now. <sighs> How do you fight with that? Because oh I can't love you I've got her and when I get back to her my life will be complete and you're human I'm not going with you I'm going with my mirage mom. Well we've had that a number of times with the children and they literally do know the truth, but that's logic. And the logic is too painful and too hard to bear, so they create a mirage that's not real. We've got to burst that bubble with the mirage moms, if you have that issue. What I do is I say, you know, it's very important that you respect and honor your birth mother. As an adoptive mother or as a foster mother, I teach them to respect and honor others. And a birth mother gave this child life, gave me one of the greatest gifts I've ever been given. I'm going to respect and honor the birth parents, mom and dad. No matter what they have done wrong, they did the best they could. They probably didn't get the help. They probably didn't have a loving family like you are. They didn't get what they needed, so they were struggling. Self-medicating with alcohol or illegal drugs is how people numb out the pain inside of them because they haven't resolved it. Okay, so what we do with the Mirage Mom, we respect and honor her, and we say to the child, we want you to know how to respect and honor your birth mother. You have to practice to be able to do that. You can't turn respect off and on. You are respectful. It's part of who you are because it's how you treat people. So when you learn to respect me, you'll be able to respect her. When you are able to love me and act lovingly and treat me lovingly, you will be able to love her and treat her lovingly. You need to treat me with respect and honor and love for six months. And when you can do that, I will do all I can to find your birth mother and we'll see what we can do. And you know what I've had happen over and over and over? After they treat me with respect and love for six months, they don't even ask about birth mom anymore because their brain has healed enough to where they know the truth and they remember the abuse, the neglect, that she chose alcohol over them and wouldn't work with the social service program or whatever. They know. Maybe you don't have Mirage Mom, maybe you have some of the other ones, grandma or teacher or church folks or neighbors. So we've got to educate the saboteurs. Get material. There's articles on my website at attachment.org. You can copy and print. There's a letter to the teachers that's outstanding. There's a letter to the bus drivers. You can modify those for neighbors. Um, feel free to cut and paste anything that's going to help you to get the message across to the saboteurs. Uh, we have webinars that grandparents can watch. Um, help them to understand. If you go to all the trouble to educate, loan them books and tapes and articles, and they still are doing the poor, poor sweetums or whatever, unfortunately, you have to fire them. And it's really hard to fire a grandparent, okay? But they cannot be around your child as they continue to hurt them while you are trying to heal them. They can't. So what I like to do is I write a letter to Grandma, say, we love you very much. For the next six months, I am going to be focused on healing my child's heart. We will not be taking phone calls or having visitors during this time. We will be focused on saving our child. All our time and attention will be going to that during this time. I will be sending you a card every week to let you know that we're alive and well. I would really appreciate it if you could pray for us. If you want to send cards of encouragement, we would absolutely love to have those but we will not be having phone calls and visits for the next six months. I'm going to respect and honor Grandma as we must, no matter how far off track she is, no matter how much pain she has caused, she has to be respected and honored. All right, But she doesn't need to be in our house doing her stuff 
or on the phone or on the Skype, it's eliminated until the child is stable and healthy and there's no more game playing. Grandma's off the team or grandpa or the neighbor lady or whoever it is. They're off the team. The child does not see them. And when I'm working on saving a drowning child's life, I'm not answering my phone. There's an answering machine in those machines. How about that for cool? Mm -hmm. I return calls when my children are in bed at night or if they're taking a nap. Okay, A lot of times we do a siesta after lunch so I can catch my breath. So I'd have a house full of kids and everybody would go to their room with a puzzle or a book, something to do, and spend 45 minutes playing with their game. Right, so that I could return calls, catch my breath a little bit, and be a loving mother all afternoon. I did that with the big ones, not with the little ones. The next roadblock we're going to take a look at is safety. Our children absolutely have to feel safe to heal. It is one of the biggest keys to making a difference in the lives of these children. That feeling of safety comes from a lot of different things. There has to be zero threat or fear of rejection. We don't say stuff like, if you do that, I'm sending you to an institution, boarding school, military school, whatever. You're going to have to go live with grandma. We don't say those things. You might think it. You might feel it. You don't say it. Okay? Parents that use action instead of anger have control of themselves. We have to demonstrate self-control for our child to learn self-control. If our eyes turn into glaring you know, swords, every time the child gives us a hate look, they're like, wow, I can control your eyes. I'm so strong and powerful, I can make you furious in an instant. When they're furious, we don't have to be furious. We can have control of ourselves, like, gee, my child's having a bad day. I'm not. Yep, he's chosen some really bad choices today. I'm fine. We use action, not anger, all right? Uh, parents and teachers have to be strong leaders. Teachers have our children a lot of hours during the day. If the child is manipulating, conning, controlling the teacher in any way, they will come home and take it out on you. And they'll go down the drain. I've had children almost end up in an institution because of the teacher. I had to pull them out of school. Huge issues there. We have to be strong leaders at home, rested and ready to take charge to lead the children says safari on there because I love to use that as an analogy. So it's kind of like, picture this. You and I are going on a safari to Africa. Okay? Now, I'm a photographer, so I would take my cannon to shoot. And it would be a cannon or an icon kind of deal, not uh, 22 or whatever. Um, that kind of shooting is not my style. But so you and I are going on a safari to Africa going to the deepest jungles. It's going to be the most exciting adventure. We saved up. We got our pith helmets and our jackets with all the, you know, you have to have the right jacket with all the pockets if you want a safari. Okay, we've hired a guide. The guide is supposed to be like top notch. He knows the jungle like the back of his hand, so he knows where to take us, where the animals are, and it's all going to be good, right? So we get off the plane in Africa, and we walk up to the edge of the jungle with our guide in front of us. And he turns around and looks at us and he says, which way do you want to go? How would you feel? I would be scared. <laughs> like, I thought you knew which way we were going. I have no clue. I have never been to the jungles of Africa. I don't know where the pit holes are and the scary snakes and whatever. I have no clue. Why would you ask me which way to go? You're supposed to know. And I would be scared, wouldn't you? I see parents do with their children all the time. What do you want for lunch? They don't know anything about nutrition. They don't know what their body needs. Why are they choosing? What game would you like to play? They have no idea. Which direction would you like to go on our walk today? And one dad, he said, you know, I like to have my kids take turns leading the family when we're going on a big hike. Your child should lead the trail when you're out on a hike when they can handle a robber or a rattlesnake better than you. Until then, absolutely not. They shouldn't be answering the door. Who knows who's going to be there? They shouldn't be answering the phone. It could be some psychopath. We lead the way. Of course, our children need to learn how to deal with those things, but they learn by following a great leader. Strong leadership child absolutely cannot be conning and manipulating adults. They won't trust them. Whether it's the therapist. We've had therapists where the child comes in, they say, what would you like to work on in therapy today? 
Oh my goodness, who's leaving? What game would you like to play? Why are you playing games with my child? Excuse me. Oh, they'll open up their deepest feelings over a Monopoly game. Well, good, I'll play Monopoly with them at home. Okay, that is not therapy. So, for a normal, healthy child who has some issues, play therapy and talk therapy can be very helpful. For a child with reactive attachment disorder who has trust issues and manipulation issues, absolutely not. Okay? So, they have to have no threat or fear of pain in their home from siblings, from parents, from the neighbor coming in the window or whatever might be scary to them. We have alarms on the window and the door so they know they're safe at night. We're not having threats on the inside of the house. Leaders don't allow the little people in the house to hurt each other, right? We've got control of that. So our next one we're going to take a look at is pain and hunger. These can be roadblocks to healing. I had one little guy, he was 15 by the time we found out, very violent, very aggressive, angry all the time. And they did a scoliosis test in school and he had a back issue. So they said, you need to go in and have your back checked because it wasn't scoliosis, it was something else. He had had severe back pain his entire life and he had never mentioned it because he was born that way. He just assumed everybody had that same level of pain. Well, pain really makes you cranky. I don't know about you. It makes me really cranky. I just went through some a few months ago. I can tell you about this. Um, well, they got his back situated, got it all taken care of with the great medical help. He was a different child. Happy, wonderful, helpful. We need to watch out for that stuff. Physical pain hinders bonding. Premature birth where there's lots of tubes and needles, there's not enough touch. My daughter is a nurse in the neonatal unit, and she says they're taught breathing before bonding, which is a very good thing. <laughs> We've got to keep them alive, okay? But as soon as we get their life saved, then we need to pick up the pieces, and that baby needs to be in someone's arms hours and hours and hours a day, listening to that heartbeat healing from that separation. Unresolved back or hernia pain where we don't even know they're in pain. We need to check those things out. Constant colic, uh, frequent ear infections, where they just s very, very painful when they have all that swelling in the ears. Um, urine, burning their skin over and over as a baby that's neglected and not changed and kept clean. Injuries such as broken bones that haven't been resolved when they're little. A lot of our children come from such hard places where they're not given the medical care that they need to have to heal the wounds that they receive in that environment. The solution, have a great doctor on your team. Do a thorough checkup. Check for toxins. We've had children who came from meth labs or had a birth mother who was doing meth and they were never tested for lead and arsenic. Lead causes aggression and learning problems. Arsenic is the same. When they come out of those environments, they've been saturated with it, highly likely it's soaked into their little bodies. They need to have that tested. Uh, parasites, they live in filthy environments where they're eating dirt and whatever kind of stuff. They can sure be loaded with parasites. You're feeding them great food, their body's not getting what it needs. Hormone imbalances can cause big issues there. So have a great doctor on your team to check out and make sure your child's not in pain. When our children have too much pain when they're little, they shut down their nervous system that lets us know we have pain. So they don't say anything. One child I was working with came downstairs and he came, Mom, he said, my ear hurts. And just as I looked in it, I just pulled the earlobe to take a look. It burst. The infection burst and the green stuff was pouring out. That had to have hurt a long time before it got to that level. He didn't feel it. He never said a word. A lot of our children have turned off the feeling in their body to survive because the pain was overwhelming as babies. So we need to be very much in tune. When I hug a child, I often put my face on their face to see if they've got a fever because they won't let you know. They do all kind of, oh, I have a broken arm when they just barely bump it. But when they really have something... We aren't going to hear about it. We need to be in tune. Another solution that I like to do is a QEEG brain map. That's a quantitative electroencephalogram brain map. 
and then we can see what's going on in there. If we've got issues in the temporal lobes where alcohol affects the brain so much, if we've got issues in the logic and reasoning and self-control areas, if it's clear back there on top of the uh, spine right at the brain stem where we've got it all lit up because they're in fight or flight all the time, I love to have a brain map so we can see what's going on there and help them more effectively. Hunger can also be one of our roadblocks. Food is about survival and nurturing. All right. When we have a child who's been starved, we've got to serve meals on time. You're an hour late for lunch, their whole system goes, I might starve again, I might starve again, I might not get fed, I might get, not get fed. And the fear factor builds up the cortisol, shuts down the thinking, logic and reasoning, out the window, and the child doesn't trust us. And we've got issues. So I'm not one of those, you know, I run everything on time kind of a person. But for my children, I found absolutely essential meals were on time. That fear factor really interfered with their healing. So we serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner absolutely on time. Okay, there needs to be enough food on the table. If it's a small bowl and they're looking at it, there might not be enough for me. I might still be hungry. There might not be enough. When they've been starved, I make sure there's a big bowl of food or platter or whatever we got going on so they know there's enough for seconds and thirds if they need that. An emotionally disturbed child is not given control of the menu. Wise adults select the meals, not the child. Anxiety and trying to control the universe eats up a lot of calories. Our brain uses most of the calories in our body, okay? Unless you're running marathons. That could be a little different balance than the rest of us. But anyway, our children need a mid-morning and a mid-afternoon snack that is protein. And our proteins, of course, are meat, cheese, nuts, and eggs. All right? They crave carbs. We all crave carbohydrates when we have high stress level. The carbohydrates do not fuel the brain. They don't fuel the body. They just make us rounder, all right? Um, healthy carbohydrates can be a good fuel for the body. But out of balance between the protein and the carbs, then it's not a fuel. It becomes storage. So carbs are pastas, bread, chips, cookies, sugar. That's what they crave. When they get up in the night, they're not stealing the protein. They're stealing the carbs because of the high stress level they live with. It's destroying their life. All right? So we got to feed them good food on time to take care of that hunger block. All right. Our last roadblock is a big one. Not least of our roadblocks is having the structure and the nurture in balance. Having that balance is really, really important. So let's take a look at it. All right. Structure is healthy limits and boundaries. In the beginning of the healing process, we use a lot of structure, very high structure, where there's a lot of limits and boundaries, keeping them in very close, monitoring everything that they do. They're given direction for chores and fun activities. They're not just wandering around at any point. Uh, limits are set on each. You may play with the Legos as long as you stay on the beach towel and play silently. So they can test the limits and, you know, we can move forward from there. All right, so be prepared to meet the limit setting without any anger, with loving leadership. And more freedom is given as the child accepts responsibility. So as our challenging children are healing, we provide tight structure and powerful nurturing. So let's take a look at the nurturing. Okay, nurture is how we show our love and our care. Twelve hugs each day during the healing time. That's a lot of hugging. If you use our 3BI program, Getting those 12 hugs in a day is a piece of cake because your kids kind of balance the uh, amount of hugs and they let you know. All right, a hug is total acceptance. We talked earlier about how that impacts the brain. Hugs change and build the limbic system of the brain and that's where our emotional centers are. And we want to make sure that we're building that part of the brain, making it stronger with our hugs, our power food. All right, snuggle time and sharing sugar, funny stories and songs. Very important part. Of nurturing for our children that didn't get that or they didn't soak it up real well when they were really little so we spend that time right here filling them up with goodies laughing and sharing together it's not a time to bust them for not cleaning their room you know when you're that close it's a time to share and be close all right uh, smiles from our heart that means our eyes are smiling it's not just showing that the teeth it's our eyes smiling because that message of you're important to me, you're special, I believe in you, needs to come from our eyes. 
And they can bond to you if you look like this picture here in the slide. You see, those eyes are just filled with overwhelm, exhaustion, we don't know what to do, oh my goodness, what's going to happen next? And when we look like that, our children are feeling the same thing. Our eyes are saying, oh my goodness, what's going to happen next? What are we going to do? What's going to happen? Are we going to be okay? Can we make it through? And they're not thinking about, I'm so glad I live with you. I'm so glad I have you for an awesome mom, an awesome dad. They're missing all that because our eyes are giving the wrong message. So our heart needs to have the right message. Our eyes need to have the right message. When the structure and nurture are out of balance, we get too much structure in place, not enough nurture, whoosh, there they go, right down the tube. Because it's out of balance, we're just snapping orders, doing military drill sergeant kind of parenting. And, you know, there's a time and a place for a drill sergeant, but it's not it at home in the family, okay? They're great in the military. Um, so the child doesn't feel safe when things are out of balance, too much structure, not enough nurture, and they're going to crash and burn. So we don't want to go that direction. We also don't want to do the exact opposite. Too much nurture, not enough structure, where there's not enough limits and boundaries. You know, he probably didn't mean it. It was probably an accident. He probably didn't realize he should have picked up his clothes. He probably doesn't know he needs to make his bed. He just forgot. You know, we make excuses for them or just look away rather than correcting marshmallow parenting, we call that, okay? They don't feel safe, Shh, crash and burn. So getting that balance right is what it's all about. When we have the structure and the nurture in the right balance, just enough structure for this child, just enough nurture, they feel safe. Everything's stable. They've got advanced it. parents know where the structure and the nurture needs to be for their child, and that's what we want them to have so that they feel safe. They've got their needs met. There isn't a roadblock because our parenting's off track. My friends Silver and Melissa from Alaska gave me this beautiful pin and it's got a fireweed flower painted on it. It's a piece of bone that's thousands of years old that they've carved on. It's called Scrimshaw. And she wrote, the fireweed is a beautiful flower with an interesting trait. After a wildfire comes through and desolates the landscape, it's the first vegetation to reappear, thus earning its name. It sets down a deep root system that allows it to spread quickly and endure future fires. It has a vibrant pink flower that brings beauty from ashes. It reminds me, as it reminds Melissa, of you. You come after a firestorm in a child's life and help turn their landscape from something burned and ugly into something beautiful. You help them establish deep root systems that they can weather future storms so when the fire comes up again they can spring right back up with beauty and hope. No matter what the fire or storms life brings you never stay down. So the little fireweed is just a little flower but you parents out there and you mental health professionals working to help children put down those deep roots to handle all the stress and all the things that are going to come their way are just, there's no words to describe. I call you awesome parents, but that's not even enough. I appreciate what you do. I appreciate your love for the children that are so hard to love. I appreciate all the effort you put in day and night to giving them the best chances to heal. Your heart is their heart medicine. And from my heart to yours, I thank you.